In the U.S., a candidate can lose the election but still win the presidency. President Trump did it in 2016. So did George W. Bush in 2000. It's a unique and controversial system known as the Electoral College. How does it work? And is this 18th century institution a good fit for 21st century America? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. As many as 150 million votes will be cast in this year's U.S. presidential election. But the votes that really count belong to just 538 people, the presidential electors. That's who people are really choosing when they tick a box for Donald Trump or Joe Biden. It's a system that's unique and often confusing for outsiders. In five elections, it's, puts the man, it's put the man who lost the popular vote into the White House, three times in the 1800s, and twice in the last 20 years. Even among Americans, the electors are often a mysterious group. But we have two of them with us here today to help explain the system and ask why America still uses it. We'll bring in our guests in a moment, but first, here's our White House correspondent, Kimberly Halkett, with more on the Electoral College. When Americans vote on November 3rd, they're not technically picking a president. They're choosing delegates known as electors. Now, the electors vote on behalf of their state, and it's those votes, not the people's votes, that pick the president. It's called the Electoral College, and the Electoral College does not grant degrees, nothing is debated, it doesn't even meet in a single place. But it is the votes of those 538 people in mid-December, not the tens of millions of Americans who will vote in November, that will actually choose the president of the United States. So how does it work? Each state has the same number of electors as its total members of Congress, its House members plus two senators. So small states like Vermont and Wyoming have three, while California has 55. Texas has 38, New York and Florida 29 each. Now, there's nothing in the Constitution saying that each state's electoral votes have to be winner-take-all, but since the early 1800s, that's the way the system has developed. And that is why Hillary Clinton could win the 2016 U.S. election by 3 million votes and Donald Trump became president. It's also why in the year 2000 that the entire presidency came down to just a few hundred votes in Florida. All right, let's bring in our guests who are all in the United States. In Burlington, Vermont, Keisha Ram is a Democratic elector candidate there, and she's also running for the state Senate. In Fairfax, Virginia, Jennifer Victor, professor of political science at George Mason University, and in Riverdale, Maryland, Jim Wass is a Republican elector candidate in the state. He's also chairman of the Republican Central Committee in Prince George's County, which is in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Welcome all to the program. Keisha, let me start with you. You're an elector. How exactly did you get this job? So thank you for asking. And as a candidate who's likely to win a state Senate seat, I will become the first woman of color in the Vermont State Senate. I am also the first woman of color to be chosen as an elector in the state of Vermont. It was a decision mostly made by Democrats here in Vermont because we're a pretty blue state. And uh, we are chosen by the executive committee of the Democratic Party. And I would have never thought to apply for something like this, even as someone involved in politics, because you usually think of your statewide and federal uh, delegation for this kind of honor. But someone on that committee said it's been uh, never in history have we had a woman of color who's represented us as an elector and with Kamala Harris on the ballot, it would make a lot of sense. And so I'm honored to have that role, even though we'll get into the challenges with the Electoral College. Jim, let me ask you the same question. As an elector, how exactly did that happen for you? Uh, this time, again, it was selected by the executive committee of the uh, state party. I did ask to be considered. I have previously been uh, an alternate delegate <clears throat> to our nominating convention, and uh, I've been active in the party for a time. And uh, uh, this is often an honorific for various reasons. Like uh, she said, uh, sometimes the uh, elected officials and sometimes people who are older in the party have been around a, a while. 
Jennifer, is, is this how all this was intended to work? And, and why exactly does the U.S. have this system? I'm not sure that they, it was intended to exactly turn out the way that it has, but essentially during the time of the drafting of the Constitution back in the 1780s, uh, there was a lot of disagreement um, over a number of topics. And one of the topics over which they had a hard time coming to agreement was how centralized to make the power structures in the federal government. Um, and there was some debate about how to create a democracy that wouldn't be subject to sort of the whims of the people who may not be as educated or, um, you know, sort of to protect the, uh, the robust structures of government from what is essentially populism. Um, and there was a lot of controversy about how to do that, how to both have democracy and stability in the same system. And one of the odd compromises that they came up with was the Electoral College, which was a system of um, actually using this set of uh, political elites, they were intended to be elites at the time, uh, to do the actual voting for president, but still providing a mechanism where everybody, at least uh, all those who were granted the right to vote, which at the time wasn't very many, uh, to select those, those electors. So it was seen as a way to protect the stability of the federal government structures. Um, over time, as suffrage rights expanded and... and um, you know, more and more people participate, um, and the Electoral College is no longer about uh, selecting elites or using elites to select the president. It's now, as the guests, uh, your other guests have said, a sort of an honorific position of uh, those who uh, want to be honored by their local political parties or those who uh, sort of have a, have a stake and are, that are major players in, in state party politics. Keisha, from your vantage point, does the Electoral College make the U.S. less democratic? So you heard a little bit earlier that Vermont only has three delegates to the Electoral College while California has 55. And that sounds like a dramatic difference in California's favor, but it's actually a dramatic disproportionate favorability for Vermont. Uh, as an elector and one of three people in Vermont, I represent about 200,000 voters when I cast my vote. Whereas a California delegate represents closer to 700,000 voters when they cast their electoral ballot. So really, there's uh, a, a deep favorability, as we've seen in some of these uh, presidential elections, towards smaller rural states rather than our urban centers with high populations. Now, you would think I'd be happy for that in Vermont, but most Vermonters um, agree, and we've debated this in our legislature and come out the other side, that we would rather be part of a national, national popular vote system. And we joined a number of states making up 200 delegates overall that would like to move to a national popular vote system. When we reach 270 delegates, that a group of states will have the power to help us transition to a national popular vote system and elect the president based on the overall uh, population of the country and the principle of one person, one vote. Jim, are electors compelled to vote for the candidate who wins the most votes in their state? There was a recent uh, Supreme Court case uh, involving, I believe, the state of Washington. Uh, correct me, uh, Professor Jennifer, uh, but the uh, the uh, electors chose to vote for uh, a different person, uh, Colin Powell, or uh, uh, some, uh, or the alternate candidate, somebody who either wasn't in the race or uh, uh, somebody who was not the candidate that they were pledged to, and uh, that state le levied sanctions on the individuals, and uh, they were uh, that went through to the Supreme Court, who said yes. And it's based on Article 2 of the Constitution that says each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, each state shall appoint. And so uh, that pledge uh, the state can enforce, according to the Supreme Court. Jennifer, this statewide winner-takes-all method for choosing presidential electors, this was not mandated in the Constitution, but it developed pretty quickly, right? Yeah, it did. It became the, the convention uh, more or less right away. So while some aspects of the Electoral College system are outlined in the Constitution, and that makes them, frankly, very difficult to change because the barriers to changing the Constitution are quite high. You have to get a two-thirds vote from each chamber of Congress and three-quarters of the state legislatures to agree. Uh, so we've, we've only amended the Constitution 27 times in this country. Um, but uh, the... 
you know, but because we have this winner take all system that a lot of people think uh, is perhaps not ideal, um, it would be difficult to change, which is why, as, as Kesha was mentioning, there is this national uh, compact that has been signed on to by a number of states um, that's frankly relatively controversial. It's not at all clear that it would pass constitutional muster um, or that. Uh, if a state was put into a position where they had signed on to this compact in which they agreed to give their electoral college votes to the national popular vote winner, regardless of which way the state went, um, if a state was put into a position where they were, uh, by the compact, required to give their votes to a candidate that the state did not, in fact, support, you could see how that would produce a sort of dissatisfying and, and perhaps destabilizing uh, type of political situation. Um, so while I'm very sympathetic with the idea that the Electoral College is very much outdated, it's not particularly democratic, it doesn't fit very well with modern institutions and the way modern politics works, um, it is too hard to change, and I'm not convinced that the National Popular Vote Compact is necessarily the best solution for going about fixing it, but um, at, least it's, at least it's an attempt. Keisha, as an elector, is there any conceivable set of circumstances that exist by which you would not vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris? There is no circumstance under which I can see myself changing my vote. Um, and at the same time, the, the pledge that electors take is in no way that visionary or lofty or really aligned with the US Constitution. You're essentially saying, um, I will face penalties unless I vote for the candidate chosen by uh, the state. And in my case, then, if as a Democratic delegate, I would only be activated if we uh, support Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But you're not saying that you'll do what's in the best interest of the country or anything that's open to interpretation. You are strictly a, a Democratic or Republican delegate casting your vote, depending on your state's popular vote. Jim, I saw you nodding to some of what Keisha was saying. Did you want to add anything to the point she was making? Uh, that, uh, remember, we're by party, so if, uh, the one candidate of our party wins, we, ought, we cast that vote. If the candidate of the other party wins, somebody else, another candidate for elector, will cast that vote. If I may, I'd like to challenge one of the initial characterizations there. Uh, Hillary uh, had a larger number by a count, but there is, in our country, no certifiable popular vote. That is to say, because the states, beyond a few limited federal criteria, create their own rules for elections, how far people can vote in advance, how late people can register, uh, how uh, mailed-in votes, absentee or otherwise, uh, are postmarked, uh, how the signatures are verified or not verified. So that is to say that when California, which has significantly different rules, casts its vote and counts its tally, that is not analogous to how the, the Florida, for instance, vote is counted and how that is certified. So those certifications are within the state to decide that state's result, but they are not equivalent enough to create a certifiable national result. Jennifer, if Joe Biden wins the presidency, if the Democrats retake control of the Senate, do you think we will see a push anew to try to abolish or reform the Electoral College? It's an interesting question. You know, I think that if Democrats prevail in this election um, and wind up with control of essentially the executive and legislative branches, um, I think they're going to have a pretty long laundry list of things that they want to get done. Um, and uh, how they sort out that uh, priority list um, is going to be a matter of internal party politics. And while I think um, any move that the United States can make that is towards more democracy is, in my mind, should be our highest priority since we've been through, we are now going through a period of some democratic decline. Um, it's not clear to me that uh, the party would necessarily prioritize something like an electoral college reform uh, right out of the gate. Um, in, 
I actually think they would they would do quite well to do other things to expand voting rights and so forth. Um, and just to agree uh, with my co-panelist here, as, as Jim was just saying, we don't have a national election of any kind in the United States. We don't hold national elections. We don't use national referendum. We don't elect the president on a national popular vote. We have a series of state and local elections that happen to be held simultaneously that we use to aggregate to uh, select a national office like the president. Um, and there's goods and bads about that particular system. Um, and, and some of the, the negative aspects have been pointed out here today. I would just add that the uh, the fact that the system is so decentralized in a way provides uh, an element of robustness and resilience to the system. Um, so in some ways, it makes the system more resilient to external threats. Um, now, there, there are other reasons to think that we should have a more centralized or controlled system, especially when it comes to voting rights, which is perhaps the most important right uh, that a democracy can help protect for its citizens. Um, but to, to be more direct to your question, you know, Democrats are interested in reforms to health care and immigration and voting rights um, and uh, environmental protections. Um, and so there's, there's this laundry list of policy things that they want to get done. And then there's this other discussion about more institutional reforms. Perhaps the Electoral College, there's talk about reforms with respect to the courts um, and other things. Um, and it'll be interesting to see exactly how they sort those out. I would expect them to, at the outset, prioritize one or two things that they think could they could really get done so that they can point to some accomplishment and over which there might be some more widespread agreement. And I'm not positive that the Electoral College will wind up at the top of that list. Okay, so let me ask you the same question. If Joe Biden wins the presidency, if the Democrats retake control of the Senate, are we going to see the Democrats push for abolishing the Electoral College? Well, I certainly can't speak for national Democrats, but I can tell you at the state and local level, uh, this is something that Republicans should really be applauded for focusing on, that Democrats should be focusing on a lot more. They're never going to be the splashiest issues for folks to care about redistricting, which is going to take place right after we do the new 2020 census and figuring out what our congressional districts will look like, how we enfranchise more voters, and how we uh, put the power of the vote back in the hands of more people. Because in fact, as we've heard, uh, this decision may be made by 500 and some odd folks, but it could also be made by nine unelected people on the Supreme Court. And Republicans have really had their eyes on that prize uh, pretty considerably and have, you know, um, sort of bent conventions and uh, bent uh, graces to get those seats on the Supreme Court. So Democrats need to play hardball and think about how we win elections just as much as how we govern and what policies we advance. Jim, if you're talking about attempting to abolish the Electoral College, you're talking about having to amend the Constitution, and that's something that's pretty much impossible right now, correct? Uh, not impossible, but the, uh, uh, the ratification level is very, very high uh, with a large number of the states, not a simple majority, and each of the legislatures would have to hold a ratification vote. Right now, I would imagine they would fall several uh, states shy of that. Uh, but also, if we're going to uh, have a national popular vote, we need national standards for voter registration, uh, the dates uh, of it, the nature of it. We would need uh, national standards for uh, such things as uh, mailed-in votes, uh, or the, the uh, vote harvesting in California. Would that be part of it, or would that be eliminated? We would have to have the exact same election period for everybody. I've often uh, recommended a 24-hour period so everybody could have any time of a day that they wanted to. Uh, but we wouldn't be able to have some states starting their early vote in September or August and other states starting it the week before the election. So uh, we would need national standards for a very large number of uh, items. And that would take some time to uh, come to. And that would be a predicate to ratification for many of the more skeptical states. Jennifer, I just want to step back for a moment and look at another facet uh, of the formation of the Electoral College originally. I want to ask you, what role did slavery play in the creation of the Electoral College, and how was the formation of the Electoral College a concession to slave states? 
Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, when the drafting of the Constitution was going on, it's important to remember that uh, they came together not to draft a constitution, but rather to amend the Articles of Confederation. The constitution that we live under today is really Constitution 2.0 of the United States. Constitution 1.0 was the Articles of Confederation, and it was an attempt at creating a, a country that essentially failed. It was a massive failure because of a lack of centralized power. Um, and when they came together to try to resolve that and wound up drafting the Constitution, uh, as I said earlier, they disagreed over a number of things. And one of the primary disagreements that they had was over slavery. Uh, the, the, st the Southern states that were primarily involved with a, a system of human sla chattel slavery uh, were very protective of that system and uh, very reluctant to give it up. Um, and and northern states uh, that saw it as an abhorrent and immoral practice um, and who had other disagreements with it really wanted to get rid of it. And essentially, there was no way to resolve that dispute. And it became pretty clear among these drafters and founders that the only way that they were going to be able to form a country was essentially to not address the issue of slavery, um, which in a way, you could you could say that they punted it, but uh, it's, it's also a way that sort of the anti-slavery folks wound up uh, giving in. They agreed that it was more important to form a country than it was to get rid of the system of slavery. So they wound up prioritizing forming a nation over the idea of eliminating slavery. And their willingness to prioritize forming a country, we can see in the various uh, compromises and systems built into the Constitution, from the Electoral College to bicameralism, to having a Senate that has equal number of representatives from each state, to the system of federalism itself and the system of checks and balances. Um, all of these were compromises made at the time as a way to get these uh, competing factions mm. to agree to form a country and share power. Jim, it looked like you wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Uh, am I that obvious? Now, I was just noting uh, uh, that uh, Virginia, which, which entered as a slave state, had nearly 700,000 people at the uh, 1790 census, and Rhode Island had 68,000, roughly, a free state. Connecticut next door had three and a half times that, around, around 240,000. Uh, so uh, Rhode Island was thus given uh, proportionally more power, as Keisha noted, uh, than Virginia. Uh, its uh, uh, slave holding, uh, a, 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 a slave holding state, and uh, Connecticut, its next door neighbor, was also not able to overpower it as much with three and a half times the population. So uh, the uh, rural city, agricultural, industrial, mountains, plains, all of those divisions, all of those divisions bring in different interests. And uh, the Electoral College softens that, softens those uh, edges just a little bit. Keisha, if there's a tie in the Electoral College, the House of Representatives then decides the presidency, but it's not the representatives of the states that are voting, correct? And, and how much does that further complicate matters? Well, that might be a better question for Jennifer because you know, I've been trying to figure out exactly uh, what would happen. And, and that's something that's, you know, entirely possible. Are you, um, let me ask you this. You know, are you so concerned that we could see a tie? Because we're in a situation where even though Joe Biden leads the polling nationally uh, by quite a margin, uh, it's much tighter in those key swing states. Are you concerned about that? I, I am concerned. I mean, I think this is, you know, in Vermont, we're the home of Howard Dean and, the, and Bernie Sanders and a 50 state strategy. And the idea that you don't only go into swing states, uh, you know, and talk to folks about what they care about in those areas. You go to every state, you listen on the issues, you don't rack up your delegate count and play out that strategy as much as actually hear what's on the minds of all Americans. And so, you know, moving away from this mm -hmm. electoral college system and it takes all in swing states would really help us hear about actual issues on Americans' minds. Jennifer, we only have about 90 seconds left. Let me ask you what I asked Keisha, which is how much more complicated does it get if there is a tie and this goes to the House? First of all, let me just say it's, it's extremely unlikely. It's never happened in U.S. history, so I don't expect it to happen this year. Um, however, essentially what happens is if you wind up with a tie in the Electoral College, the House of Representatives is asked to uh, resolve that tie. And the way that system works is that each state is given one 
uh, one vote. So the, the, the electors or the delegates, or excuse me, the delegates from that state, the representatives from that state um, come together and try to offer a consensus choice from that state. Uh, and and under that math, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty there about exactly how that would go. But it was all, it would also be pretty close uh, if it was Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden. It would be pretty close. It's hard to say exactly which way that would go. Um, it looks like Trump might have an advantage on a state by state count uh, that over Joe Biden. Um, but again, I think that scenario is pretty unlikely to occur. All right, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much to all our guests, Keisha Ram, Jennifer Victor, and Jim Wass. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.